أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. So we completed our analysis of the Battle of Uhud and some of the events that took place immediately after the Battle of Uhud. Uh, in today's episode, I'd like to uh, examine some of the most important events of the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah. Now, one of the things that happened, and I'll just kind of quickly go down the list and we'll, we'll, I'll go into more detail. Among the things that happened towards the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah is that you have the revelation of a Quranic verse that formally and completely prohibits the consumption of alcohol. So this happens at the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah. In addition to that, another notable event a tragic event is that at the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah, we have the passing of Fatima bint Asad, the mother of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. A happy uh, occasion that took place in the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah is the birth of Imam al Hussein, third of Sha'ban, fourth year after the Hijrah. In the, at the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah, we also have the, the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Umm Salama. And then finally, uh, we'll speak about uh, the second battle of Badr. It's a battle that never took place, but we'll speak about what this second battle of Badr was all about. But we begin uh, our discussion on the prohibition of alcohol. As many of you know, my dear brothers and sisters, alcohol consumption, especially during the age of Jahiliyyah, during Zamanul Jahiliyyah, was very common among the Arabs. It was a common vice. Virtually everybody drank wine and consumed alcohol. They consumed intoxicants. Now, historical accounts, narrations tell us that when the Muslims were camped outside of the fortress of Banu Nadir, and we spoke about that in our previous episode, the banishment of the, the Jewish tribe of Banu Nadir. The final verse banning alcohol consumption was actually revealed at that time. As the Muslims were, uh, uh, as they laid siege to the, the fortress of Banu Nadir, that ayah of the Quran uh, announcing the complete ban on alcohol consumption was revealed. So, you know, it's interesting to note here that uh, the banning of alcohol is something that was introduced gradually and in stages. And this shows us the, the wisdom of the Sharia. You know, because alcohol consumption was ingrained in uh, Arabian culture, it would be very unwise to expect a community that had developed this habit over many generations, and it's, it's become part of their culture, to expect people to just abandon these habits overnight. Now, when you look at the, the prohibition of alcohol in the history of Islam, you see that it happened in four uh, main stages. So it was officially banned, it was completely banned in the fourth year after the Hijrah. However, the, the discussion of the harms of alcohol consumption actually began in Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, in Surah An-Nahl, Surah 16, uh, verse 67, which is a, uh, a Meccan surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن ثمرات النخيل والأعناب تتخذون منه سكرا ورزقا حسنا Allah says and of the fruits of the palms and the grapes you obtain from them intoxication and goodly provision now here 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights that there are two ways to use grapes and dates. You can use them to make intoxicants. Or you can use them for something good and something beneficial. So look at the, 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 the subtle way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially tells the early Muslims that intoxication is bad. Allah doesn't explicitly tell them that intoxication is bad. He just says that there is a beneficial way to use grapes and dates. So when Allah says you can use them for intoxication or goodly provision, the implication is that intoxication is not a good way of using these fruits. So you see that the Qur'an begins the, the ban on alcohol by simply pointing out that, yes, it's used, it can be used for intoxication, but it also can be used for something that is beneficial. And by highlighting that, that it has a beneficial use, you're implying that intoxication is something that is harmful and something that is not beneficial. So it begins with this very gentle reminder that there is a useful and a beneficial way to use grapes and dates. Then in the second stage, we have the early Medani period where, and, and where you have Muslims asking the Prophet, they ask you, and this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 219. They ask you, O Muhammad, about wine and gambling. You know, these are two activities that were very common. These are things that people enjoyed very much, especially during Zaman al Jahiliyyah. So now they're asking, you know, are these problematic uh, habits? And then here you see that the Qur'an has uh, kind of escalates the, uh, uh, the discussion. The Prophet is instructed to tell them, قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا They ask you, O Muhammad, about wine and gambling. Say, in them is a great sin. So here, there's an escalation. In Mecca, Allah simply pointed out that grapes are used for intoxication, but they also have this very goodly way of usage. It has a goodly provision. Here Allah explicitly says that in them is a great sin. It's harmful. Yes, it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most impartial. He says that yes, I am not denying that, that wine has its benefits. Yes, you know, you can make a lot of money. It has its benefits. But just because something has benefits, it doesn't mean that you ignore the harms. And with the case of gambling and alcohol consumption and wine consumption, the harm is greater than the benefit. And this, you know, this principle, we can apply it to anything. We can apply it to, you know, people who advocate for uh, the usage of marijuana. You know, they argue that, you know, it has all of these positive effects. Yes, no one is denying that it might have some benefits. But how about the harms? You have to also consider the harms. Maybe the harms are more significant than the potential benefits. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Medina, you see that there's a, a, uh, a stronger tone in condemning the usage of alcohol. Now in the third year after the Hijrah, and this is the third Qur'anic verse, and they were revealed in this, in this order. So immediately after Uhud, there were some companions who were still drinking wine. They were still consuming intoxicants. So they were praying, you know, they were listening to the, the, uh, the sermons of the Prophet, they were fighting alongside the Prophet in Jihad, but... You know, some of them uh, had this addiction to wine. So there was an incident where after the battle of Uhud, one of the Sahaba was leading prayer and he was under the influence. And he recited Surah Al-Kafirun. 
And because he was drunk during prayer, because he was under the influence, he said what? قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ he, he omitted one of the letters and basically said, Oh disbelievers, I worship what you worship. So when he made this error in the recitation of the Qur'an, when he made that mistake that completely changed the meaning of the Qur'an, because he was under the influence, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this verse. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun O you who believe, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying. And this is in Surah An-Nisa verse 43. So now, you have a clear prohibition. You are not allowed to pray while you are intoxicated. But up until now, wine and intoxication has not been completely outlawed. And therefore you see that some of the companions who used to drink wine, what they would do is, uh, after for example Salatul Isha, they would drink wine, they would drink it immediately after prayer, so by the time Fajr arrives, they're not in a state of intoxication. And maybe they pray Salatul Fajr, and they're sober, and then maybe early in the morning they have a cup of wine. And they have it early so the intoxication wears off by the time they pray dhuhr. But then, but then it became such an inconvenience. You know, because you're praying throughout the day, you have a very small window of time to consume, uh, to consume alcohol. So what's, what, se- what must have happened is that you have some companions who were trying to drink early enough so that the intoxication wears off, but they still found themselves under the influence when they would approach uh, the prayers. And this is where you see the fourth Qur'anic verse that was revealed on this issue was during the siege of Banu Nadir's fortress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 90, He says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسُرُ وَالْأَنصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِجْسٌ مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ O you who believe, indeed intoxicants, gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than God, and divining arrows, which was, which was some type of lottery, are but defilement from the work of Satan, so avoid it that you may be successful. فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ Here is a clear command to the Muslims that they must avoid consuming intoxicants in a complete way. Not only before, not only to pray, but there is now this complete ban on the consumption of alcohol. So this took place in uh, at the end of the fourth year uh, after the Hijrah, the banning, uh, the prohibition of alcohol. Now another incident, another tragedy uh, that took place, a tragedy that took place at the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah, uh, was the passing of Fatima bint Asad, the mother of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, the wife of the Prophet's uh, beloved uncle Abu Talib. Now there is a, in terms of the, the great status of Fatima bint Asad, there is a, a very lengthy tradition from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, and this narration is mentioned in Al-Kafi. It's a very lengthy tradition where Imam al-Sadiq highlights uh, some of the merits of Fatima bint Asad, and he, he essentially sheds light on how beloved she was to the Holy Prophet, and the incredible love uh, that she showed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi throughout his life. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, إِنَّ فَاطِمَ بِبِنْتَ أَسَدْ أُمَّ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كَانَتْ أَوَّلَ مْرَأَةٍ هَاجَرَتْ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ مِنْ مَكَّةَ إِلَى الْمَدِينَ عَلَى قَدَمَيْهَا She was the first woman who 
emigrated from Mecca to Medina on foot. She was a muhajira. She was the first one uh, to, to join the Prophet. If you remember that there were, you know, uh, the, the fawatim were left behind when the Prophet was escaping that assassination attempt. And she was among the first ones uh, to enter Mecca. And she did it on foot. And this shows you the hardships, the great hardships she endured uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Imam says, وَكَانَتْ مِنْ أَبَرِّ النَّاسِ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ And she was the most righteous and the most kind to the Prophet She was known for her love and her great devotion to the Messenger of Allah. And then the Imam, of course, I'm taking excerpts of this very lengthy uh, tradition. Uh, the narration continues and says that one day Fatima bint Asad, she heard the Prophet speaking about the difficulties of Qiyamah, specifically the condition of people on that day, the day of resurrection. She says, فَسَمِعَتْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى Imam al-Sadiq says that one day she heard the Prophet speaking about Qiyamah and he said, إِنَّ النَّاسَ يُحْشَرُونَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ عُرَاتًا كَمَا وُلِدُوا The Prophet ﷺ, he says that people will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment naked as they were born. They will be exposed on that day. So when Fatima bint Asad heard that people will be resurrected in that state of complete vulnerability, in their complete nakedness, as the day that they were born in this life. She was concerned. She felt embarrassment. She was concerned about being exposed on the day of Qiyamah. When the Prophet heard, when she uh, presented her worry and her concern to the Prophet about her own uh, condition on the day of Qiyamah, the Prophet said, I will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resurrect you fully covered on the day of Qiyamah. And of course the dua of the Prophet is answered, it is mustajab. And then the Imam al-Sadiq says, وَسَمِعَتْهُ يَذْكُرُ ضَغْطَةَ الْقَبْرِ And the Prophet also spoke about the squeezing in the grave, that squeezing that happens to many people in the grave, which is a sort of purification that needs to take place uh, because of you know, the sins that we carry with us into Alam Al-Akhirah. When she heard about this idea of the squeezing in the grave, فَقَالَتْ وَضَعْفَى that you know how weak I am. How am I going to endure, you know such such a calamity? فَقَالَ لَهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ when the Prophet heard that she was concerned and worried and afraid of the squeezing in the grave, the Prophet says فَإِنِّي أَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ أَن يَكْفِيَكِ ذَلِكَ that I have asked Allah to exempt you from that. Uh, that squeezing in the grave. The Prophet prayed for her protection in those difficult moments. The narration of Imam al-Sadiq continues, and this is where we fast forward to the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah. فَبَيْنَمَا هُوَ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ One day the Prophet was sitting. فَبَيْنَمَا هُوَ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ قَاعِدٍ The Prophet was sitting in the masjid in Medina. This is at the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah. إِذْ أَتَاهُ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Imam Amir al muminin He enters. He, he, he goes, he sees the Prophet sitting. وَهُوَ يَبْكِي And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib rushes to the Prophet and he's crying profusely. فَقَالَ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ The Prophet looked at Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib seeing him weeping and he said to him, Why are you crying? What happened? فَقَالَ مَا أُمِّي فَاطِمَةً Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he tells the Prophet that my mother Fatima has died. She has passed away. 
فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وأمي والله Oh, Ali, it's not only your mother who has passed away. My mother, she was my mother as well. وَقَامَ مُسْرِعًا حَتَّى دَخَلَ فَنَظَرَ إِلَيْهَا وَبَكَى The Prophet immediately stood up to go and see her, to see her, her, uh, her, dece- her dead body. And the moment the Prophet saw the lifeless body of Fatima bint Asad, Rasulullah began to cry. He began to weep. ثم أمر النساء أن يغسلنها The Prophet ordered the women, the believing women, to wash her body. And then he said to them, when you finish, don't do anything until you consult me. So after they prepared her, for uh, after they finished washing her, the Prophet sallallahu The Prophet, after they finished Ghusl al after they finished the washing of the body, the three Ghusls, the Prophet gave the women one of his shirts and he said to them, Shroud her with my shirt. وَقَالِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And the Prophet said to the other Muslims that if you see me doing anything that is strange or things that I have never done before during this funeral, ask me about it. So the Muslims were observing the way that the Prophet was conducting himself during the funeral preparations of Fatima bint Asad. And after... They washed her after they shrouded her. دخل صلى الله عليه وآله فحمل جنازتها على عاتقه. After they prepared her for burial, the Prophet carried her janaza on his shoulders. You know, it's not that the Prophet asked others to carry the janaza; he carried it himself. فلم يزل تحت جنازتها حتى أوردها قبرها. The Prophet remained under her janazah. He carried her. He did not even take a break. He carried her janazah all the way until he deposited her body into the grave. ثُمَّ وَضَعَهَا وَدَخَلَ الْقَبْرِ Not only did he put her inside of the grave, he went down into the grave himself. Imagine, brothers and sisters. فَضَّجَعَ فِي So he lowers the body of Fatima bint Asad. And he lays down in the grave beside her. ثُمَّ قَالْ فَأَخَذَهَا عَلَى يَدَيْهِ حَتَّى وَضَعَهَا فِي الْقَبْرِ He positioned her in the grave and he came close to her ears. ثُمَّ نَكَبَّ عَلَيْهَا طَوِيلًا He remained laying beside her for a long time. يُنَاجِيهَا وَيَقُولُ لَهَا He remained there and he was whispering to her. Imam al-Sadiq says, and he was whispering to her, Ibnuki, Ibnuki. He was whispering to her, your son, your son. ثُمَّ خَرَجَ وَسَوَّى عَلَيْهَا Then he came out of the grave. He covered the, the, uh, the grave with dirt. He ordered that it be covered with dirt. فَسَمِعُوهُ يَقُولَ And then the Sahaba, they heard the Prophet saying, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ There is no God but Allah. اللهم إني أستودعها إياك. Oh Allah, I leave this trust, this wadi'ah, this precious trust in your hands. Look at how he would refer to her. He referred to her as a wadi'ah, as a trust that was with us, and now I am returning this trust to you. ثم انصرف. Now, of course, the Muslims, they definitely notice that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله did certain things at her funeral that he had not done with any other uh, Muslim. فَقَالَ لَهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ إِنَّا رَأَيْنَاكَ فَعَلْتَ أَشْيَاءً لَمْ تَفْعَلْهَا قَبْلَ الْيَوْمِ Ya Rasulullah, we saw you do things during this funeral that we never saw you doing before this day. فَقَالَ الْيَوْمِ فَقَدْتُ بِرَّ أَبِي طَالِبِ 
إن كانت ليكون عندها الشيء فتؤثرني به على نفسها وولدها. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله he says today I missed I lost the tender love of Abu Talib, meaning that I lost this family, the family of Abu Talib, him and his wife, meaning that the love and the devotion and the care that Fatima bint Asad showed the Prophet was no less than the love and the care and the protection that Abu Talib himself showed the Prophet. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says that this woman, Fatima bint Asad, she would give priority to me over herself and her children. Meaning, Rasulullah was more beloved to her than her own children. If there was extra food, she would ensure that the Prophet is fed. She, her most important, her, her most important concern was that the Prophet is safe, that the Prophet is protected. And then he says, he tells the companions that you know, one day I mentioned that on the day of judgment people will be resurrected naked. And she was worried about being exposed on the day of resurrection. فَظَمِنْتُ لَهَا أَنْ يَبْعَثَهَا اللَّهُ كَاسِيَةً And I prayed to Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would resurrect her covered on the day of judgment. وَذَكَرْتُ ضَغْطَةَ الْقَبْرِ And I mentioned the squeezing of the grave. And she was worried. She was concerned about the squeezing of the grave. And I made dua that Allah would protect her from the squeezing of the grave. And this is why I made her wear, I shrouded her with my shirt so that she would be protected. So in honor of the shirt of the Prophet ﷺ, that the, the adab, the, the squeezing of the grave was lifted. When kabtu alayha falaqantuha, and I laid beside her, and I was close to her in her grave, and I was dictating to her, I was doing talqeen, ma tus'alu an, fa innaha su'ilat an rabbiha. The angels were asking her about her Lord, and she responded. And the angels asked her about her messenger, and she responded. And then she was asked about her wali, who her imam is. And of course, you know, she did not live to witness the formal, explicit uh, designation of Amir al muminin So she did not know how to answer. And this is why I whispered to her saying, your son, your son, your son Ali is your wali. He is your guardian and he is your imam. So this, the, the death of Fatima bint Asad was a very uh, painful moment in the life of the Prophet Now after uh, this tragedy, there is also a very joyous occasion. And it was a joyous and a sorrowful occasion. And this is the birth of Imam al Hussein salam. You know, the birth of Imam al Hussein is perhaps the only birth where it is a birth of where there's an atmosphere of joy that's mixed with an atmosphere of sorrow. You know, all of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, were martyred, but the story of their martyrdom was not mentioned at the time of their birth, with the exception of Imam Al Hussein, because his martyrdom is unparalleled. And this is why you see that. On the day of his birth, there are also tears that are shed for Imam al Hussein. I want to just briefly share a narration that is reported by Al Hakim al Naysaburi in Al Mustadrak al Sahihain. And again, for those of you who are not familiar with this source, Al Hakim al Naysaburi is a Sunni hadith scholar. He wrote a book which is a supplement to Sahih al Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. And he basically added, 
he compiled narrations that are authentic based on the methodology and the authentication process of Bukhari and Muslim, but they were not included in their hadith collections. So these are ahadith that are sahih based on the methodology of Muslim and Bukhari, but they were not included in those hadith collections. So he reports the following narration, عن أم الفضل بنت الحارث أم الفضل is presumably the, the wife of Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib. She reports that أنها دخلت على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله. She reports that you know one day I entered into the presence of the Prophet and she says to the Prophet يا رسول الله إني رأيت حلما منكرا الليلة. She says يا رسول الله I saw a horrific dream tonight. It seems that she saw a dream, she was terrified and she rushes to go see the Prophet to tell him about this nightmare that she had. So the Prophet said, what is, what is this nightmare that you had? قالت إنه شديد. She says, Ya Rasulullah, it's such an awful dream, I can barely even speak it. The Prophet says, tell me, what was the dream that you saw? She says, رَأَيْتُ كَأَنَّ قِطْعَةً مِنْ جَسَدِكْ قُطِعَتْ وَوُضِعَتْ فِي حِجْرِي She says, Ya Rasulullah, I had a dream. I had a nightmare where I saw that a piece of your flesh was cut off of your body and it was put into my lap. A lump of your flesh was in my lap. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ رَأَيْتِ خَيْرًا The Prophet said that this is not a nightmare. This is a good dream. This is, a, this is something that is positive. This is a glad tiding. تَلِدُ فَاطِمَةُ إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهِ Fatima will give birth to a boy, إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهِ فَيَكُونُ فِي حِجْرِكِ That he will be... This is a, Fatima will have a child and this child will be in your lap, meaning that you will play a role in his upbringing. He will you know, grow up to an extent uh, in your lap. The narration continues saying, فَوَلَدَتْ فَاطِمَةً الْحُسَيْنِ Fatima alayhi salam, she gave birth to Imam al-Husayn. فَكَانَ فِي حِجْرِي كَمَا قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ that, that Fatima gave birth to Hussein. And Hussein, you know, one day he was in my lap and it was exactly as the Prophet ﷺ uh, prophesied. فَدَخَلْتُ يَوْمًا إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ فوضعت, فَوَضَعْتُهُ فِي حِجْرٍ Umm al-Fadl, she says, one day I was holding the young Hussein who was an infant and I entered into a room where the Prophet was sitting and I placed the young Hussein in the lap of the Prophet. You know, imagine how beautiful this moment is, this beautiful scene of the Messenger of God holding his infant grandson in his lap. Umm al-Fadl, she says, ثُمَّ She says that I, for a moment, I just glanced at the Prophet. And I noticed something strange. فَإِذَا عَيْنَا رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ تَهْرِيقَانِ مِنَ الدُّمُوعِ She says, I saw the Prophet's tears dripping from his eyes. They were streaming down his face. The Prophet was crying. قَالَتْ فَقُلْتُ يَا نَبِيَ اللَّهِ بِأَبِي أَنْتَ وَأُمِّي مَا لَكَ She said, My, Ya Rasulullah, why are you crying? What's wrong? And this is where the Prophet says, Atani Jibra'il alayhi salam fa'akhbarani anna ummati sataqtulu ibni hadha. The Prophet says, Jibra'il came to me and informed me that my people, my ummah, will kill this son of mine. Faqultu hadha? Umm al Fadl says that your ummah is going to kill this child? Faqala na'am, yes, they will kill. My beloved grandson, وَأَتَانِي بِتُرْبَةٍ مِنْ تُرْبَتِهِ حَمْرَاء And in fact, Jibra'il brought to me the soil 
the, he brought to me the soil from the land in which he will be martyred. And it is red soil. So you see that even the Prophet had in his possession the turba of Karbala. Even Rasulullah respected and understood the sanctity of the land of Karbala. And unfortunately today, you know, many Muslims, they mock and they ridicule the Shia for having reverence for this turba. This is the, the first one to have the turba of Imam Hussein was the Prophet himself, gifted to him by Jibra'il. So this was the, the birth of Imam al-Husayn Another occasion, another event that occurred at the end of the fourth year after the Hijrah was the Prophet's marriage to Umm Salama. And inshallah, uh, in the upcoming episodes, we need to speak a little bit about the Prophet's family life you know, because many of the wives that he married, many of the women that he married, uh, he married them you know, during the middle of the Medani period. So uh, inshallah, we'll speak about some of the other wives of the Prophet, the circumstances that led the Prophet to marry them, what was the Prophet's motivation, what was his aim and his objective in marrying so many women, why was he permitted to marry more than four. Uh, so we'll speak about uh, uh, some of the lesser known wives of the Prophet and we'll also speak about uh, the Shi'i perspective on uh, uh, figures like Aisha and Hafsa, just, just to gain a more comprehensive understanding of how these, uh, these women are viewed by Sunni as well as Shia Muslims. Now, uh, so today I'll speak a little bit about uh, the, the marriage of Umm Salama and I'll expound uh, on uh, the, uh, the issue, the topic of the wives of the Prophet in uh, upcoming episodes. So Umm Salama, her, her name is actually Hind bint Umayyah al makhzumiya So she's actually from the same uh, clan as, uh, as Abu Jahl. And she was, uh, as we discussed in our earlier episodes, she was one of the earliest converts to Islam. Uh, she was among those who went on that uh, uh, hijrah to Abyssinia. In fact, uh, many of the events that took place uh, in Habasha were actually narrated by uh, Umm Salama. She's a very important uh, narrator of a hadith of the Prophet She participated in both hijras actually. She participated in the hijra to Abyssinia and she also uh, pr performed the hijra uh, from Mecca to Medina. Uh, in the Battle of Uhud, of course, she was married to Abu Salama, and Abu Salama was Abdullah uh, ibn Abdul Asad, who was actually a cousin of the Prophet on the Prophet's mother's side of the family. Uh, in the Battle of Uhud, uh, she played a pivotal role in uh, providing assistance to the Muslims. She would bring buckets of water and she would assist in any way that was requested of her. In the Battle of Uhud, of course, Abu Salama fought in the Battle of Uhud. Uh, however, he was uh, severely wounded and uh, narrations mentioned that he passed away shortly after the Battle of Uhud. You know, a few weeks or a few months after the Battle of Uhud, Abu Salama passes away. Now, interestingly, there's a very beautiful uh, conversation that happens between uh, Umm Salama and Abu Salama. When Abu Salama was on his deathbed, uh, his beloved wife, Umm Salama, she came to see him and uh, she said to him that I heard that if a pious man, if a man who is bound for paradise, if he dies and his wife never marries, she never remarries, uh, she will automatically go to paradise with him that they'll be reunited in Jannah. And then she says, and I also heard that if a woman who is bound for paradise, if a believing woman dies and her husband doesn't remarry, uh, I heard that they will be reunited in paradise too. So she says, uh, you know, because you know, many men, you know, many husbands perhaps have this, this fear or this worry that, you know, is my wife 
going to remarry after me. You know, some husbands don't care, some do. So, um, Um Salama basically, you know, very, uh, she tells him that, don't worry, I'm not going to marry anyone after you. So, you know, let's make a promise to each other that we're not going to marry, remarry if, if one of us dies. So this was her, you know, uh, her way of saying to Abu Salama that I, I was your wife and I will always remain your wife and I will never remarry uh, after you. Now here, interestingly, Abu Salama, he says to her that if I ask you to do something for me, would you do it? Will you obey me if I, uh, if I request something from you? And Umm Salama, of course, being the, the loving, uh, devoted wife that she is, she says, yes, I'll do whatever you, you tell me to do. So Abu Salama told her, you know, as he's on his deathbed, and he knows that he's going to die, he says to her that after I die, I want you to marry someone. I want you to get remarried. And on his deathbed, you know, look at the, the piety of this man. He makes a dua on his deathbed saying, Oh Allah, bless her, bless Um Salama with a husband that is better than me. Someone who will take care of her and who will never harm her. And what's interesting is that during his life, Abu Salama learned a beautiful dua from the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. And it's a dua that he loved so much that he actually taught to Um Salama. And the dua is, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Indeed, we belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. Allahumma, Allahumma jurni fi musibati. Oh Allah, reward me for my calamity. You know, whenever we go through difficulties in life and we're patient, we should ask Allah, Oh Allah, compensate me for my suffering. Compensate me for this hardship. Wa akhlif li khayran minha. And replace this calamity with something that is better. So, Um Salama, she says that after Abu Salama died, I remembered that dua and I recited that dua. You know, in uh, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. Oh Allah, reward me for my calamity. Reward me for the difficulty of losing my beloved husband and replace, uh, replace for me, uh, replace something that is better. Give me something that is good. Replace this calamity with something that is, that is better for me. But then after she recited this dua, uh, she thought to herself that who can possibly be better than Abu Salama, you know, this great man. You know, even Um Salama couldn't even imagine marrying, couldn't imagine finding someone who was better than her husband. So after the death of Abu Salama, the first one to propose to Um Salama was actually Abu Bakr, and she, she, she declined. And this is interesting because Abu Salama says that I want, uh, oh Allah, allow her to marry someone who is better than me. Now, it seems from this narration we can, we can assume that that Abu Bakr is not better than Abu Salama. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have you know, facilitated uh, that marriage. In any case, he proposed, she declined. And after some time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa proposed to her. Now, of course, she was completely taken aback when the Prophet expressed interest in marrying her and she you know being a very humble and open and honest woman uh, some narrations say that she was you know in her 30s and at that time uh, that was considered an older woman uh, you know so maybe she was in her 30s or 40s it's not clear but when the prophet proposed to her she says to the prophet you know inni musinna that ya rasulullah you know i'm advanced in age you know i'm not a young girl i'm not a young woman I'm an older woman. I'm in my, you know, mid late thirties, maybe. Uh, without a tam, I have children. I have orphans. Uh, and I'm also a jealous woman. You know, I I don't like to share 
uh, my husband, and I know you have other wives. So, so I perhaps I'm I'm not what you want. You know, I'm not, you know, a young. I'm not young. I have, you know, orphans. You know, I don't want to be a financial burden upon you. And I also have this, you know, this jealousy issue. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa he says, "Ana asannu minki." The Prophet says, "You know, as for your age, well, I'm older than you, so that's that's not going to be a problem." And again, this is kind of a glimpse into the uh, the humor of the Prophet that you know I, I've I'm also struck with this you know this calamity of, of old age. So I'm I'm older than you. Wa iyaluki iyalullahi wa rasuleh. You know, as for your family, you know, your family is God's and his messenger's family. You know, you're not a burden upon me. And then he says, And he says that I will pray to Allah to remove that jealousy from your heart. And after the Prophet made this dua, you see that the she never uh, she never used to uh, irritate or bother the Prophet. She never had a jealousy or enmity towards any of the uh, the other wives of the Prophet. And Umm Salama, you know, among the wives of the Prophet, of course Khadija is in her own league. Khadija is uh, by far the most beloved uh, wife of the Prophet. And Umm Salama is probably, you know, uh, definitely one of the most uh, respected and beloved wives of the Prophet. And uh, she was a, a beautiful woman, a very pious woman, a very noble woman. And she was also a woman of great wisdom. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ sometimes used to consult uh, Umm Salama on pretty important matters. You know, for those of you who are familiar with the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and inshallah uh, in subsequent episodes we'll speak about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which happened in the sixth year after the Hijrah. Where the Prophet, you know, saw a dream that that uh, that him and the Muslims were performing Umrah, so they they uh, they leave Medina with the intention of entering Mecca to perform Umrah. They're intercepted by the Mushrikeen, and they eventually uh, have to turn away. They have to turn back because of uh, they end up signing a peace treaty with certain terms, which I don't want to go into right now, but. The point is that many of the companions uh, were frustrated. They were unwilling to accept the terms of this treaty and they insisted on uh, performing Umrah, even though the Prophet said that I'm, I'm going to go back. So there was a lot of back and forth and bickering and complaining. So Umm Salama, so the Prophet consulted Umm Salama on you know, what to do you know, because some of the companions were being stubborn. They were refusing to shave their heads and remove their ihram. So Umm Salama basically said to him, Ya Rasulullah, don't negotiate with them. Don't negotiate with your companions. Just shave your head and head back to Medina and they'll follow you. So you don't need to convince them that this is the right thing to do. Don't even negotiate. You are the leader. You are the messenger of God. Shave your head and walk back to Medina. Those who follow you will follow you and those who are stubborn, let them stay behind. So the Prophet took uh, her advice, and uh, when the companions saw that the Prophet shaved his head and he was walking back, he was heading back to uh, Medina, they had no choice but uh, to follow. Um, another thing uh, that we see is that uh, Umm Salama narrates many important ahadith, and among the ahadith that she reports, of course, the uh, Hadith al-Kisa, you know, one version of Hadith al-Kisa is narrated by, uh, by Umm Salama. So there are, uh, she's a very important transmitter, a very important narrator of Ahadith. There's one Ahadith, one Hadith from Umm Salama, and this is reported by Imam al-Sadiq, where he says, سألت أم سلمة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله عن فضل النساء في خدمة أزواجهن. أم سلمة once asked the Prophet about the status and the merits, the reward that will be given to women for being at the service of their husbands. Because you know, even at that time, you know, some some women probably felt that you know, why is it that the men 
have all of these opportunities to serve Islam and they're the ones who go out on these expeditions and they front, fight on the front lines and they have the opportunity to earn martyrdom, we feel like we're left out. So, Um Salama asks the Prophet, you know, what is the thawab that will be given to a woman, to a wife who's serving her family, who's serving her husband? You know, and unfortunately, we live in a time where we devalue domestic work. You know, the only work that has value is if a woman is working for a company, if she's working outside of the house, but the household chores, the domestic uh, duties are usually uh, devalued. And this is where the Prophet Sallallahu says, أَيُّمَنْ رَأَةٍ رَفَعَتْ مِنْ بَيْتِ زَوْجِهَا شَيْئًا مِنْ مَوْضِعٍ إِلَى مَوْضِعٍ تُرِيدُ بِهِ صَلَاحًا إِلَّا نَظَرَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهَا وَمَنْ نَظَرَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ لَمْ يُعَذِّبْ The Prophet says, any woman who so much as moves something from one place to another in her husband's house with the intention of improving it, you know, your wife sees something, she sees a table and she moves it to a place that's you know, better and it's going to be less hazardous or it's going to make the family more comfortable. Whatever. She does something very you know, uh, minor to make the home more comfortable for the family. The Prophet says, if a woman just simply moves one household item from one place to another to make the home more comfortable for the family, The Prophet says, it is regarded with mercy by Allah. Allah will look at such a, uh, uh, He will glance at such a woman with rahmah. And whoever Allah glances at with mercy, and I'm using the word glances metaphorically, whoever Allah regards with mercy, He does not punish. So, So these domestic duties are one of the keys to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. You literally protect yourself from uh, divine punishment. So you see how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, incentivizes us to look after our families, to look after our households, to care about one another, to make each other comfortable because ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants families to be stable. He wants families to be places of love and consideration and, uh, and courtesy. Uh, as for the second battle of Badr, I think I'll leave that for, uh, for the upcoming episode. Uh, this is something that happened uh, after the battle of, uh, of Uhud. Uh, inshallah, we'll, d- we'll discuss that uh, in detail in our next uh, episode. Uh, thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in uh, once again. And I look forward to having you join me on upcoming episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد. Welcome, Sheikh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, so uh, there's one question. Um, the person is saying that in their community, uh, there's a lot of discussion around like the, the youth around addiction to weed and alcohol uh, when they talk to the youth. Yeah. And how how can the community or how should the community be addressing this issue of addiction that the youth are facing? And is it something that should even be discussed? Yeah, I think it, I mean, it definitely should be discussed because it's something that's plaguing our communities. Now, I think that we have to first start with, uh, with education. I think, you know, in many cases, uh, these, you know, people become, they might become addicted to these things because they, they don't see them as harmful. They might not know, the Islamic ruling when it comes to uh, uh, marijuana usage. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, because this is a detailed fiqh discussion, but you know, in a nutshell, uh, marijuana. That you know, there are there are many different types of marijuana, but you know, the main reason why people uh, use marijuana is because of the THC. You know, that is the chemical that gives you that that feeling of uh, that that you know that that high feeling, right? So people, they use marijuana because that, that euphoric experience, they get high and what makes them high is the, the THC. Now, that is classified. THC is actually classified uh, by experts to be an intoxicant. So THC, so marijuana that contains THC is haram because we know 
as a general rule of thumb, as a, there's, we have jurisprudential maxims to the effect that if something has the potential to intoxicate you in large quantities, it is even prohibited in small quantities. Now, if the marijuana contains CBD and not THC, uh, it is permissible to use if it is prescribed by a qualified doctor. You know, say, you know, someone is having issues with pain management. So if you need it for medicinal purposes, you can use marijuana that is prescribed by a qualified doctor. And that marijuana must contain, must not contain THC, but rather uh, CBD. So because of, now, now because of its addictive properties, uh, it should, you should exercise caution when, uh, when using it. So if it's for medicinal purposes, it's okay. But I, the majority of people, the marijuana that they use contains the THC because that, that's, that is the, uh, the chemical that, that creates that, uh, that state of intoxication. And I, and I think that, you know, to, to take it a step further, you know, now that we know that uh, it's prohibited, Except under uh, specific, in spe except in specific cases, like I mentioned, I think it's important to also pay attention to the company that we keep. You know, if you don't want to be, if you don't want to be get addicted, it's probably not a good idea to associate and to be in the presence of people who are addicted to marijuana, because ultimately. Our friends, our companions in life are going to have a huge impact on our beliefs, on our habits, on our practices. So that's why it's, it's very important to, to consider very carefully who we spend our time with, the friendships that we have. You know, if, you're, if you hang out with people who are always smoking weed, chances are you are going to be tempted to, to join them. And then, you know, before you know it, it's going to become this, you know, commonplace uh, recreational activity and it will consume your life. And then you will reach a point where you cannot function without, uh, without marijuana. And I think that, you know, that is a very uh, sad way to live because if, if what you're looking for is tranquility, you're not going to get that through chemicals. That's, that's a false sense of tranquility. The real tranquility is, is the remembrance of Allah. You know, you want real tranquility, you have to live a God-centric life. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna achieve and attain tranquility through, uh, through the uses of these chemicals. Thank you. And uh, when uh... Fatma bint Asad, when she was in the grave, and uh, in the hadith where uh, he said that the prophets, uh, when the angels were questioning her, and the prophet said to him, like, oh, your son Ali is your imam? Yeah. Uh, shouldn't the imam at that time have been the prophet himself because he was the actual guide of the time? Why, why, why would the answer Imam Ali? You know, it's, so when it comes to the issue of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, it seems that there are certain people at this juncture in the history of Islam who should know that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is the successor of the Prophet. So he's not the active uh, Imam at the time, but he is the, uh, the successor of the Prophet. So because Fatima ibn Asad is part of that, that inner circle She's the wife of Abu Talib. You know, she was even told by Abu Talib that you are going to give birth to uh, to the wasi. But this shows you that you know, death can be such a difficult experience that you you can even forget some of the most basics of faith. And this is why we do talqeen to the mayit, because when you are in a state of fear and you're in a state of shock, you know some of these. Uh, these realities, these basic tenets of faith are not firmly uh, rooted in the heart. So because, you know, she was a pure-hearted person, 
she needed a little bit of uh, that uh, that assistant, that that assurance that that uh, that your son is your uh, your wadi. So yes, if if any other Muslim had passed away, perhaps they wouldn't have, they would have they wouldn't have been asked about you know who their wali is because many Muslims probably didn't know. Now after Ghadir, then the the announcement has been made and it has been made explicitly and that announcement has reached you know uh, the general uh, public the general Muslim community that's when now you have an obligation to uh, to to accept the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen 